Good morning, everyone. Nice to see you. Happy Lord's Day. I mentioned during the um, prayer time that on the 21st of this, of this month, so that was Thursday, I think. Anyway, uh, on that day, 17 years ago, our, our church officially constituted as a church. And uh, we bless the Lord for his faithfulness um, over the years. There's been several cycles of people coming and going for various reasons. But um, there is a congregation of true worshipers who believe the Bible and uh, who want to worship the Lord according to the simplicity of his word. And for that, we're very grateful. Well, here we are in Romans chapter 2 as we uh, continue our study through Paul's letter here. I'd like to give you a word of testimony. We saw last time as Paul began his, um, his official argument, if you will, He's uh, getting to the point of showing that, that everyone is in sin and therefore in need of salvation, which is only to be found uh, through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. He's trying to show that that's a universal message uh, to satisfy a universal need. And as he does that in verses 18 through uh, 20, he begins with the wrath of God and how people suppress the truth and unrighteousness. And uh, even people who have never heard the name of Jesus are responsible because they, they know that God exists through general revelation, through the things that God has made. And yet what, uh, what they know about God, what is plainly clear about God, they nevertheless suppress and they uh, make this great exchange. They exchange the glory of God for a lie. Anyway, um, I remember uh, pretty clearly on a summer day, I think in 1990, when I, I heard that verse for the very first time, and it, w it was from Dan Warda. And at the time, I was unconverted. I, I didn't know that I was unconverted. I didn't know what that meant. Um, I thought I was a Christian. You couldn't have, I couldn't have explained the gospel to you if you asked me. But, and I was living an ungodly life, it turns out. But anyway, I remember I went to this neighborhood Bible study and I asked Dan about the, um, the native and deepest, darkest Africa who never heard the name of Jesus. And right away, Dan opened his Bible to Romans chapter 1 and read those verses to me. And... Uh, everything just made sense to me. I think it was, um, well, I'm convinced God just turned a light on in my mind and I was able to connect the dots and it, and it just made the world make sense to me. And to me, Romans chapter one, it's not only personal, but uh, to, to me, it's a great evidence that the Bible is the word of God. I don't think the apostle Paul I don't think Socrates, um, Aristotle, or any other human being has the capability of writing a book like Romans unless God is moving him along, unless ultimately it's, it's the word of God. So I don't think Paul just came up with this worldview. Uh, he, he got it from God. It was the Holy Spirit who moved him to write. So... After Paul begins his, his argument in Romans chapter 1, um, now we come to chapter 2, and basically he's going to touch on the case of the moral person in verses 1 through 11, the case of the pagan person in verses 12 through 16, and the case of the Jewish person in verses 17 through 29. Um, and we're not going to make it all the way through chapter 2. Lord willing, we're going to get through verse 16. So that's the case of the moral person and the case of the pagan person. But we'll watch, watch the clock and we'll be patient and uh, just go where the Lord leads, leads us. But you can hear Paul's argument. So let's begin 
Let's just jump right in to this first case here. The case of the moral person, verses 1 through 11. I believe that uh, Paul does ultimately have the Jews in mind, and he's going to specifically mention the Jews in verses 10 and 11, and he's really going to zero in on the Jews in verses 17 and following, but uh, in the opening chapter uh, verses here in chapter 2, he doesn't specifically address the Jews because he says, therefore you have no excuse, O man. So this is to mankind in general, Jews as well as Gentiles. But these are people who have a moral compass. These are people who might hear what Paul had written in chapter 1 about the unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness and their idolaters. And in verses 26 and 27, they, they give themselves over to homosexual activity, which is sinful. And then in uh, verses 29 and following, they're filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They're full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They're gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. And this kind of person will hear all of that and they're going to say, Amen! People like that deserve the wrath of God. Bring it on, God. That's the person that Paul is addressing here in verses 1 through 11. And you'll notice that as Paul addresses this moral person, this moral slash judgmental person, he says, therefore, you have no excuse. And I believe that's some very intentional irony on the part of the Apostle Paul. Because earlier, when it came to, to pagans, they were without excuse because God had made himself so plainly known to them, and yet they suppressed that truth and unrighteousness, and they exchanged the truth about God for a lie. So they're all without excuse. And now Paul says to the moral person who doesn't know Christ that the moral person as well is without excuse. Therefore you have no excuse, O man, every one of you who judges. For in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself, because you, the judge, practice the very same things. So passing judgment on another, that's the problem of the moral person here. Uh, and what Paul is describing, passing judgment on another, is basically a self-righteous person who proudly stands in judgment over others. They, they see themselves on a different moral plane. Everybody else, they, they murder, they steal, they commit adultery, they burn things down, whatever. But they, they themselves, in their own eyes anyway, are on a different plane. And Jesus described this kind of person when he gave uh, the parable of the tax collector and the publican, when he said uh, that he uh, told this parable to those who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Luke chapter 18 and verse 9. That's this moral person. They typically they have a tendency to trust in themselves that they're righteous and then treat others with contempt. And in what way do moral people who judge others practice the same things? That's what Paul says at the end of verse 1. Because you, the judge, practice 
the very same things. Well, sometimes it's just rank hypocrisy. Sometimes people judge others for stealing, but they themselves steal in, in different ways. Sometimes they judge others for committing adultery, for being sexually impure, whatever, and they themselves are guilty of the same kind of sin. So sometimes they're just rank hypocrites doing literally the same thing. Sometimes they're just guilty of the same sins in their hearts. That's what Jesus talks about in the Sermon on the Mount. In um, Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 and 22, Jesus says, you, You've heard it said of old, you shall not murder. But I say to you, if you're angry with your brother without a cause, that's the, the addition, if you're angry with your brother, understood, without a cause, then you've murdered him in your heart. And Jesus goes on to say, if, if you call your brother Raka, which means empty-headed one, idiot, or some other bad derogatory kind of name, Jesus says you've committed murder against him in your heart. And he goes on in the same sermon, Jesus does, verses 27 and 28. And he says, you, you've heard it said of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, if you, if you look at a woman and, and lust after her, you've committed adultery with her in your, in your heart. And so... That's the sixth commandment, you shall not murder. And the seventh commandment, you shall not commit adultery. It turns out that all ten of the commandments originate from the heart. They have the, um, the violations of the ten commandments uh, have their roots in our hearts. And so the ten commandments condemn us, not just in terms of our outward behavior, but in terms of what goes on inside, what we think, what we feel, our, our motivations. So that's another way in which they practice the very same things. But then also, they pick and choose from God's commandments. So I read this list of sins that Paul gives in verses 29 uh, through 30. We talked about the sin of homosexuality in verses 26 and 27. And this kind of moral, judgmental person picks and chooses. So this person likes to say, well, those homosexuals or whatever. And yet, they're guilty of covetousness, which Paul says in Colossians chapter 3 is idolatry. Or they have envy in their heart. Or they're malicious. They're gossips. They're slanderers. They're, they're haughty. They're proud. They're arrogant. Those are also sins. Just as capable of condemning us to an eternity in hell. But the moral person tends to gloss over the sins that they're guilty of and to recognize the sins that somebody else is guilty of in passing judgment. And I would just remind you of James chapter 2 and verse 10, where James says, For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. So in these ways, those who judge practice the very same things. Then notice verses 2 and 3. Now Paul talks about the judgment of God. We know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things. Do you suppose, O oh man, you who judge those who practice such things and yet do them yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God. Here's Paul, Paul's logic. First of all, God's judgment falls on those who do these things. Second, 
Even the self-righteous judge does these things. Third, therefore, even the self-righteous judge stands under God's judgment. So another example of a great exchange, isn't it? The self-righteous judge thinks that in his mind, the unrighteous are under God's judgment. Turns out that person is as well. Moving on to verses 4 and 5. Now he talks about the moral person's presumption. Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? But because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. This moral, judgmental person despises God's kindness toward others, but is blind to the kindness of God meant to lead him or her to repentance. The judgmental person is eager for the wrath of God to be unleashed on others, but they don't see that their own hardness of heart is storing up wrath for themselves. More irony. Sinners, heathen, unrighteous, infamous he, uh, sinners, wrath. But the Bible says the judgmental person is storing up wrath for themselves. Here's another dimension of the danger of a judgmental attitude. Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. In Romans, Paul says, those who judge are guilty of the same things. Jesus um, adds this important twist. So in Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 and 2, Judge not, by the way, side point, um, lots of unbelievers don't know a single thing about the Bible, but they know that. Judge not. Aren't Christians forbidden from judging? Well, how would you, would you, how would you like it if the Supreme Court interpreted the U.S. Constitution that way? The first words in the First Amendment are, Congress shall pass no law. Well, what if we just ignore the rest of the First um, Amendment and just go with that? Congress shall pass no law. See, Congress shall pass no law. That's not what the First Amendment says. It goes on to say, establishing a religion or abridging the free exercise thereof, except in a health crisis. No, see. I just wanted to see if you were awake. <laughs> anyway, G Jesus does not command Christians to judge not. Talk about taking something out of context. The whole command is judge not that you be not judged. In other words, don't be a hypocrite. Judge righteously. Don't judge according to outward appearances, but judge righteously. Jesus says that in another context. Here he says, judge not because, in verse 2, for with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. And so the amazing thing about the culpability of fallen mankind is that all people are guilty before God, accountable to God, without excuse before God, because God has made him, himself plain to them, and they themselves go on judging. And Jesus says, 
Even if a person like this didn't know anything else about the Word of God, they've got the Word of God stamped on their hearts. We're going to get to that. And they're using that to judge other people. And if our standard of judgment by which we judge others is measured back to us, we would all be condemned. That's an amazing thought. That's an amazing thought. You think about somebody who doesn't believe in Jesus. They're, they're not following Christ. They've not been justified. They don't have saving faith. And they, they judge all the time. I don't think we appreciate how judgmental all people are. People are judgmental. Every time you watch the news and you have some sort of reaction, oh, those people on the left, oh, those people on the right, you're judging. When, when people go out and they, and they protest and they riot and they do whatever, they're, they're judging. They're, they're saying, this is right and that is wrong. You are wrong and I am right. And now I'm angry. It happens all the time. We cannot help ourselves. We are judgmental people. And Jesus says that it's one of the great ironies of human existence that someday our standard by which we judge others will be measured back to us and that by itself will be enough to condemn every single person. Isn't that profound? Back to Romans chapter 2. Paul goes on to develop this theme of judgment now. Listen to verses 6 through 11. God will render to each one according to his works. By the way, let me pause there. Do you know, that's what the Bible teaches over and over and over and over and over again. Old Testament and new. God will render to each one according to his works. Jesus taught, Matthew 16 and verse 27, For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. Jesus also said in John chapter 5, verses 28 and 29, that an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear the Son of Man's voice and come out those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. And then we saw last time, <clears throat> Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10, for we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ to, to give an account for what we have done in the body. And that's just a smattering. There's lots of verses in the New Testament that talk about how we will be judged each one according to his works. Then he continues on. He's going to describe these two categories of people. Verse 7, To those who by patience in well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. That's what it means to be righteous. Verse 8, by contrast, but those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. The unrighteous. There will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil, that's the second category, the unrighteous, the evil. To the Jew first and also the Greek, 
But then back to the first category, the righteous in verse 10, but glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good, the Jew first and also the Greek. And here's the point, verse 11, for God shows no partiality. Like Wes read this morning from the NIV, God shows no favoritism. There's not one standard of judgment for one group of people and a different standard of judgment for another group of people. And I just want to say that this is why I'm against critical race theory. And a lot could be said. A lot has been said and has been written about that. But critical race theory is all about showing partiality. It's about assuming guilt on the part of people, not because of the content of their character, but because of the color of their skin. And therefore, treating them as such. That's exactly what it is. If you don't think that that's what it's about, you're deceived. Look into it. Read it. Christians should not be for critical race theory. But back on topic, God shows no partiality, shows no favoritism. It's the same standard of judgment for all. Before we move on, we need to pause there for a minute and just catch our breath. Because what's the book of Romans famous for? If we fast forward into chapter 3, and verse 20, for example. Romans chapter 3 and verse 20. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. And then verse 28. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Right? That's what we expect from the book of Romans. That's what the book of Romans is all about. It is this methodical, detailed exposition of the gospel of God's free grace. The gospel of justification by grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone. Well then, why does Paul write in Romans chapter 2 what he does about judgment, that God will render to each one according to his works. Why does he go on to say to the Corinthians that even Christians are going to appear before the judgment seat of Christ? Well, in, in a nutshell, here's the answer. When the Bible talks about the judgment, it's talking about what happens in the future on the day of judgment, when Christ comes back again, and somehow or another, I cannot fathom how it looks or how it will be carried out. Jonathan Edwards, for example, wrote about how, you know, instead of each person standing in line and getting his day in court, it's all going to be done simultaneously through our minds and consciences. Who, who knows? But somehow or another, on the day of the Lord, when Christ returns, that's the day of judgment. And people who are unsaved are going to be publicly shown to be unsaved. And people who are saved are going to be publicly shown to be saved. They'll, they'll be vindicated. And then believers will be rewarded. And that's because of what salvation accomplishes in somebody. So we saw in Romans chapter 3, um, about in verses 20 and 28, we've, we've seen Paul talk about justification. Justification is God's legal pronouncement about a sinner who believes in Jesus. It's God's legal pronouncement that that person is righteous. God declares that person righteous, just in the sight of God. That is apart from our works. That is apart from the works of the law. The moment you believe in Jesus, 
sincerely, you're justified. Justification by its very nature can't grow. It can't change. Once you're justified, once you're declared righteous in the sight of God, once the righteousness of God himself has been imputed to your account, that you can't get more justified. That never changes. But what does change is your sanctification. And the Bible teaches this doctrine of progressive sanctification. That we, be, we become more and more holy, even as God is holy. We become more and more Christ-like as Jesus indwells us and we dwell in him. And the Holy Spirit works within us to produce holiness that can be seen. It can be evaluated and judged. And just to give you another data point, let's fast forward in Romans. We're going to get to Romans 8 someday. But notice Romans chapter 8. I'm going to quickly go over verses 1 through 8. And what I'm trying to impress upon you is that salvation, which is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, changes the believer. You'll see what I mean. Romans 8, starting in verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So this judgment that Paul is talking about in Romans chapter 2, if you're a believer, if you're in Christ, you have nothing to fear. Your salvation is not hanging in the balance. You don't have to fear condemnation. There is therefore now no condemnation, present tense, for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. And that is where too many Christians stop. Lots of people could recite what we just saw. Oh, yeah. Jesus took my place and he died on the cross for my sin. So I can be forgiven and I can live my life as a, forgi as a forgiven person. And then a lot of people reach this deadly conclusion. Therefore, it doesn't matter how I live. Because I'm saved apart from my works, and it's by grace, not according to works. So who cares how I live? I've got Jesus as my insurance policy. I'm not going to fear the day of judgment. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we shall die. That is a deception from the pit of hell. And I used to believe it. That's where I was when I, when I first visited Riverside Bible Church and actually heard the Bible opened up. And I would say some of the stupidest things. Don't ask my wife. She'll, she remembers them. <laughs> um, but that's where I was. I thought, well, I, I believe in Jesus. I'm not an atheist. But I was, I was living an ungodly life. I was not following Christ. There's no holiness. There's no righteousness. No practical righteousness in my life. Anyway... Let's read on in Romans chapter 8. So God condemned sin in the flesh in the person of his son, verse 3. But listen to verse 4. This is for a purpose. Why did God do this? In order that you can be forgiven and live like the devil. No, you can see that's not what Paul wrote. In order that the righteous requirement of the law. The law says things. The law requires things. The law has requirements. In order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Do you hear what Paul said? Jesus died 
in order that the law might be fulfilled in us. That's why God gave us the Holy Spirit. Then he goes on. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. And to use his language in Romans chapter 2, those who are in the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. Those are the ones who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness and will receive wrath and fury. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. Those are the ones who by patience and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality and who receive eternal life. Verse 6, for to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit of life is peace. And then verses 7 and 8 are so important. For the mind that is set on the flesh, that is the mind that is in bondage to the sinful nature, the mind that is enslaved to sin, that has not been changed by the transforming grace of Almighty God through the gospel, that mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It's against God, doesn't like God. It's at war with God. It's in rebellion against God. It does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Now, that's an amazing statement all by itself. Paul is saying that if you are in the same spiritual condition in which you were born, if you do not have the Holy Spirit indwelling you, or to put it in Jesus' language, if you have not been born of the Spirit, then you have that kind of mind that is hostile to God, does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. And when it comes to the law of God, to God's commandments, you'll, you'll, you'll obey them to a point, but in your heart, you don't love God. You're not living for the glory of God. You're not obeying God out of gratitude so that he gets the glory. You're not like John the Baptist who said, he must increase and I must decrease. No, you're obeying the law to make yourself look good and to establish your own righteousness and reputation. Really, your obedience is more idolatry. Verse 8, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. By contrast, those who are not in the flesh, in other words, they've been born of the Spirit. They're, they're trusting in the gospel of God's grace. They're relying on the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to render them righteous and just in God's sight. They've been adopted into the family of God so that now they're children of God. They've been given the right to be called children of God. They and they alone please God. So this judgment that the Bible talks about takes place in this context, the context of what God does in a sinner whom he saves. When God saves a sinner, he doesn't just forgive you. He does that, praise God. But he transforms you by his grace. He makes you into a new creature. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So, to wrap that up, Christians are justified apart from our works, but we will be judged on the last day 
according to our works. That's because the same grace of God that justifies us by grace alone through faith alone also transforms us into new creations in Christ. So back to Romans chapter 2. I'm going to do a time check. Um, verses 12 and 16, they're going to go by fast. So now we've noticed the case of the moral person. Now let's notice the case of the pagan person. And what do I mean by a pagan person? I mean someone who doesn't have a written moral code like the moral person does. Paul addresses them, starting in verse 12. For all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law, and all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. He's saying this, this law here is God's law in written form. The Jews obviously had that in the law and the prophets. We have that in the Bible. But so-called pagans, that's what we're calling them, who have never been exposed to God's law in the scriptures, that's who he's addressing here, they have nevertheless sinned and will therefore perish, Paul says in verse 12. Those who have the law of God will be judged as being under the law, obviously without excuse, so both groups of people will be condemned. How is this fair? I mean, that's what we're good at saying, isn't it? That's not fair. Well, Paul goes on to explain in verses 13 through 15. For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. And what Paul is driving at here is that it is not the possession of a written code. And specifically, it is not the mere possession of the law of God that does a person any good. You, will not, you cannot be justified by merely possessing God's law. If you're going to be justified that way, then you have to be justified by doing the law. But remember that there isn't such a person. Because in verse 20, once again, for by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight since through the law comes knowledge of sin. Again, it's not the possession of the law that does you good, it's doing what the law says. Now he explains the situation of the, the Gentiles, meaning pagans. Those who don't have the law in written form. Now, when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness, and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. This is really profound. Here, Paul is showing that all people are image bearers of God, including Gentiles, non-Jews, pagans. As image bearers of God, we have the law of God written on our hearts. Now, we know that mankind is not in the same spiritual or moral condition when Adam and Eve were created because of this little thing called the fall. But what Paul is emphasizing here is that even though the fall has corrupted and defiled and defaced the law written on our hearts, it is still there. Just as the image of God in man is still there. And fallen mankind, even Gentiles, show that what Paul wrote here is absolutely true. He says they show that the work of the law is written on their hearts. If you look at every single human culture in human history, no matter where across the globe you look, you see this interesting pattern 
that seems to follow the Ten Commandments. So human beings tend to agree that there is a God or gods who deserve to be worshipped. Fallen human beings without the law tend to agree that parents should be honored and obeyed and it's wrong to murder and adultery is wrong. You shouldn't take your neighbor's wife. It's wrong to steal. It's wrong to lie and to bear false witness, etc., etc. This is the law of God written on people's hearts. And so Paul is showing that even though the Gentiles don't have the Bible, they don't have the law of God in written form like the Jews did in terms of the Old Testament, and now like we as Christians do, they still are in possession of the law written in their hearts. And so that is not what separates us. What separates us is doing what the law says. And so that is what the law points to in verse 16, Paul says, he brings up the subject of judgment again, on that day when according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. Paul says, this is his gospel. And we saw him preach this gospel that included judgment on Mars Hill in Acts chapter 17 and verse 31 when he told those Athenian philosophers that God has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed, and of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Acts 17, verse 31. And you'll notice that Paul says that it is his gospel that says God judges the secrets of men. That's what the book of Ecclesiastes teaches in the Old Testament Chapter 12, verses 13 and 14. The book of Ecclesiastes says, Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. This is everything. This is man's all. This is what life is all about. For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. So it's not just what you do, it's what you think and how you feel and what motivates you. So, the case of the moral person and the case of the pagan, super quickly, two takeaways. If you're a believer, beware of a judgmental attitude. Beware of a judgmental attitude. We are called to discern the difference between right and wrong, truth and error, good and evil. And it's inevitable, whenever we do that, we're going to be told that we're judgmental. That's kind of par for the course. But we have to be careful to avoid a pharisaical spirit. Remember, they trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Be careful how you think about unsaved people. Don't despise them. Don't look down on them. Don't think that you're in a different category. We're all in the same boat, headed to hell, but God, in his mercy, reached into that boat and saved us, rescued us. But we all deserve the same plight. A judgmental attitude is offensive to God and unattractive to unbelievers. And don't forget, it wasn't tax collectors, harlots, and sinners who nailed Jesus to the cross. It was those very people who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. And then finally, if you're an, uh, an unbeliever with us this morning, and I don't know who you are, I can't read your heart, only God can. But if that's you, wow, are you without excuse. That's Romans chapter 1 and Romans chapter 2. Without excuse. You have no place to hide. You have two powerful witnesses against you. Paul says, your own conscience 
and your own instinct to judge others. In addition to what God is telling you every single day through the things that he has made about his power and eternal Godhead, you are without excuse because I know that you judge. You judge every single day. Things make you mad. Things make you upset. You, you say that's not fair at times. By doing that, you are showing that you're made in the image of God. You know the difference between right and wrong, righteous and unrighteous, but you're not using your own moral standard honestly, comprehensively, and accurately towards yourself. You think you're good. You think you're righteous. You're not. And to someone like that, the Bible says, come to the Lord Jesus Christ today. The Lord Jesus who himself is the Lord, our righteousness. <clears throat> Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. He'll save you, even today. Let's pray. <coughs> Excuse me. Lord, we thank you for the glorious gospel. We thank you for how it saves us from wrath, and for how your grace makes a difference in our lives. We pray, Lord, that you will help us to leave this place not just instructed intellectually, but uh, may we be transformed by the renewing of our minds. And Lord, we pray that today would be the day of salvation for any who do not know you uh, up to this point. Save sinners, we ask. Show the gospel to be the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen.